from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Library of Congress, for, especially to those of you who are from outside our institution. We're glad to have you here. Uh, this is a part of the Books and Beyond series of the Center for the Book. I'm John Cole, uh, the director of the Center, which is the reading promotion arm of the Library of Congress. Uh, we're also very proud of our Young Reader Center, which is entering into its fourth year. Uh, we are deeply involved with the National Book Festival and all kinds of matters related to books and reading. This series uh, really highlights new books by the Library of Congress and we always are fortunate enough to do it in partnership with some of our subject divisions uh, and often if it's a new book in partnership with the publishing office which indeed is the case today. Uh, the goal really in some ways is to hold up a book and let you meet the author who will talk about the book and to help make the point that the resources and the research uh, going on at the Library of Congress and in many other institutions often results in a book. And books have their own importance as we all know and it's our honor to be able to uh, present the author and the book. All of the talks in the Books and Beyond series are uh, really going to be videotaped for later showing on the webcast and so I'd like to ask you to turn off all things electronic and also the format will be our we will introduce our speaker uh, John we're very uh, really lucky to have him here to introduce the book uh, he will speak for about 40 or 45 minutes there'll be a chance for questions and answers and uh, if you're asking a question could make you a part of our webcast, thank you very much in advance. Uh, we will be done and start the book signing at about uh, one o'clock. And books are for sale out back in the foyer at the Special Library of Congress discount. So I hope that you will take advantage of that. Uh, in addition to thanking the Geography and Map Division and the Publishing Office for uh, the co-sponsorship, uh, I would like to thank uh, you for being here and for your support of all of the book-related activities at the Library of Congress. I'll just say a quick word about the book festival. It, this year it's September 21st and 22nd uh, on the National Mall. Uh, we have been very lucky once again in having a distinguished list of writers who are coming. Uh, we have been supported by David Rubenstein. Uh, whose the private donation has enabled us to expand to uh, two full days. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein also has recently given money to the Library of Congress for an exciting new uh, Library of Congress Literacy Awards project, which uh, also has come to the Center for the Book. Uh, so we're busy uh, gath gathering information and nominations <laughs> online for programs that promote, uh, well, really, combat illiteracy and also combat a-literacy, which is a concept that uh, has kind of grown up since Daniel Borston created the Center for the Book. And an a-literate is a person who does read, who can read but doesn't read. And so part of the award ceremony and the award, one of the three awards is really for combating uh, a-literacy and it's bringing in many, many projects and I hope that uh, We've expanded the deadline to uh, the third, 30th of April, and if you know of groups that might be interested, uh, just let me know and I will try to make certain they're part of the uh, nomination and application process. That commercial being done, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Ralph Eubanks from the publishing office, uh, one of our partners in this particular uh, program, and Ralph will introduce our speaker. Let's give Ralph a hand. Thank you, John. It is um, my great pleasure to introduce John Hessler, who's the curator of the Jay Kislak Collection of the Library of Congress and is a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society. It's been my great pleasure over the last five years to work with John on three and almost four books um, 
one of them being uh, The Naming of America, which is a commentary and a new translation of Martin Volsey Mueller's Cosmography Introductio. And just this last fall, Seeing the World Anew, the 1507 and 1516 world maps of Martin Volsey Mueller. And coming this fall will be a book that he's done with Daniel De Simone, Galileo Sidereus Nuncius, Venice, 1609. The book we're talking about today is um, the um, a Renaissance Globe Maker's Toolbox, which John Noble Wilford in the New York Times said the reason this is an important book is because it helps us understand in a unique way how our modern scientific worldview came into being. So lest you think that John spends all of his time working um, tirelessly on books for the publishing office, I'll also let you know that he is a mountaineer, very avid mountaineer, and is, is a frequent contributor to The Alpinist. So um, I'd like to just turn it over to, to John Hessler. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you about this book. Um, those of you who know my work and have, have sort of followed the Waltzie Mueller books and the sort of history of Waltzie Mueller here at the library um, know that I'm extremely critical of the way the history of cartography tends to be written. And uh, this book is, is really no different. Um, and today, what I'd like you to think about as, as I'm kind of going through the sort of history of Schoner and his involvement with the Waltzie Mueller maps, um, I'm going to assume a certain familiarity, familiarity with most of the audience on those maps. I'm not going to talk a lot about those. They've kind of been, been uh, rung through the, the ringer pretty, pretty well. So I'm going to really concentrate on Schoner. But there's a couple things I want you to kind of keep in mind. Um, sort of things that the, the general history of cartography sort of forgets about. Um, and one of the big controversies and one of the reasons that I really wanted to write the Schoner book was there, there's a couple of serious problems, um, scholarly problems, which come up when we begin talking about early modern cartography, especially cartography that's really just coming out of the late Middle Ages. And there's really three particular things that, that I, like I said, I want you to keep in mind. The first is a controversy that's been debated for many, many years um, among people who are more into the philosophy of science than into the history of science. But this is the continuity-discontinuity debate. And really what this is about is how is information transmitted? Um, this is really one of the central, central problems in the history of cartography that is somewhat ignored by the historians who simply go and look at map after map after map and try and follow a train of information. But really, how is information not only transmitted from place to place, um, but also how is, how is it involved in the production of knowledge? How do these, these things, these maps that are produced, actually produce new knowledge, and, and how do they circulate? And th that's really a two-part problem. And the, the third one is really an epistemological problem. And, and it really has to do with the mixed sciences. Now, cartography is not a pure science in, in any way. And especially when you're looking at Aristotelian categories and categories of, of knowledge that are coming out of the Middle Ages, there's really profound splits between things like pure mathematics um, and things like astronomy. Um, which tend to be one group, and then things like physics, which deal with material objects. But cartography is a mixed science. It kind of comes together and, and deals with both, um, both mathematical and astronomical phenomenon, and it also has its material basis in the fact that you're actually mapping something on the Earth. And the epistemological questions of how this sort of knowledge comes together. Um, how does a cartographer, um, someone like Martin Waltzie Mueller, someone like Johann Schoner, who's never left a little village like Santier or a city like Nuremberg, decide what pieces of information are useful, which pieces of information are going to become parts of, of a map that he thinks somewhat reflects a factual display of the world. Now, Johann Schoner, um, this is a picture of him. He's not exactly the best-looking man. Um, and this is probably the best picture of him. There's, there, there, are, there, are, there are several, several others, um, and I'll, I'll show a couple later, which um, the beard is even more scraggly. But um, Schoner was kind of an amazing character. He was um, born just before the, the discoveries of the New World, and he died in 1547, just after Copernicus published the De Revolutionibus, which, um, as you all know, is the thing that first gave us the heliocentric theory. 
Um, so he lived during these extremely revolutionary times in both exploration and science. Now, he also participated in those things um, in a number of different ways. Um, Schoener, in, early in his career, cr created a number of globes, um, which basically were based on some of Waltzie Mueller's work and some other map makers, which are really radical visions of, of, the, of the geography of the world, even more radical than Waltzie Mueller's vision. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in a little while. Um, and then near the end of his life, through one of his students, he was really instrumental in convincing Copernicus to actually publish the De Revolutionibus. Um, and so he, he has this great span of time um, where he's participating in the most important revolutions which tend to give us our modern notions of science and our modern notions of geography. Um, besides that, as a lucky happenstance, um, there's a huge archive of materials by Schoner um, that happened to survive. Um, so he's a unique character in that sense. Um, so we're going to kind of go through an overview of his life. Um, I'm going to show you some of his work, um, some of the things that he collected. Um, John Wilford Noble in the New York Times Review referred to him as a pack rat. Um, I, I've never used those words, but I wish I did, um, um, because it's certainly, uh, pack rat really describes um, Schoner. He is not a person who has actually produced any real theories on his own. Um, all of his globes um, are very, very early in his career. Um, so um, really, he's, he's a person who's a disseminator. And by the end of this, I think some of the conservators in the audience ought to consider him as the sort of proto-conservator, the first conservator, or maybe the patron saint of conservators. But Now, the reason we're interested Schoner, in Schoner here in the library is because of this book. And I want you to keep the image of this book in your mind and, and just its physical, the way it looks physically. Um, because we're going to talk about a lot of books that look exactly the same. Um, this particular book is the Schoner Samobond. This is the book um, which has now been named the Schoner Samobond, um, and that has sort of um, made its way into the scholarly literature. Um, but the Schoner Samobond is actually the book that contained the original 1507 and 1516 world maps um, that are now here at the library. Um, the 1507 map was, of course, purchased by the library in 2003 after a very long um, negotiation. There were lots of people responsible for that. Um, Ralph Ehrenberg, the chief of the Geography and Map Division, Margaret Crewson, who was very instrumental in, in, in getting it here, along with a number of other people uh, and donors. Um, the book itself, after the 1507 map was removed, was then taken back to the castle at Wolfegg, um, where it, it resided for a brief period. It was then purchased by Jay Kislak. Um, and donated to the library with the Carta Marina and all of the other paraphernalia that is in it, which you will soon see. Now, this is what the 1507 map looked like when it was in the book. Um, Schoner's gatherings are, um, as you'll soon see, are real miscellanies. Um, there doesn't seem to necessarily be a theme that, that I've been able to determine um, in the things that he puts together into these books. Um, it appears as if that he uses them for various purposes, and as we go along, we're going to spend a lot of time on late medieval and early modern astrology, because um, it's my contention that, that Schoner really had all of these materials for astrological purposes as opposed to anything else, um, that, that he really was centrally an astrologer as opposed to either an astronomer or a map maker or, or a geographer. Um, so this is what the, the book looks like when it was opened. Now, the book itself, um, is a, a peculiar story. Now, when Schoner died in 1547, his library, which contained this book and a whole bunch of other books, um, lots of manuscripts that he collected through his life, um, books that he borrowed from other libraries, um, was purchased by the merchant Georg Fugger. And Fugger um, is a very important merchant in the, in the northern Germany in the area of Vienna. And he purchased Schoner's library, and, and we can trace the history of Schoner's library down through a number of generations, all the way down to Schoner's great-grandson, um, and Schoner's, or, or rather, Fugar's great-grandson. And, and his great-grandson then sells the library, Fugar's entire library, which contains Schoner's books, um, to Ferdinand III of Austria. And those books are then deposited in the ONB, or the Austrian National Library, where they still, where they still reside. The question, however, is how one volume, the volume that we are talking about, the thing that I've termed the Globemaker's Toolbox here, 
um, made it to this castle in Wolfegg, how it became separated from the rest of those materials. Um, no one is really sure how that happened. Um, I'll speculate on it a little bit later in the talk. Um, um, but it's sort of a fascinating um, story. The, the map was actually discovered here and in fact was discovered in this room. Um, this is the Tower Library at Wolfegg. This is where um, the rare materials at Wolfegg were originally kept. Um, it was discovered here um, by Father Joseph Fisher, who was a Jesuit um, priest who was very busy um, studying Norse voyages at the time. Um, came to this library. He spent his summers when he was away. He taught at a boarding school in, in northern Austria. He would spend his summers going around to small castle libraries, kind of studying their collections and, and looking for things that had to do with Norse voyages. Um, but in this room, he discovered the Waltzy Mueller maps in, in, the, in the, the binding that Schoner placed them in. And he um, basically immediately knew what he was looking at. Um, this is a map that had been speculated about, and these maps had been talked about for many, many years, um, to the point where um, historians in the 19th century um, wrote actual books about what it might have looked like. There are actual facsimiles and drawings and things like that which actually um, show the map without ever having seen the map. Um, they knew the map because there was a small book that Waltzy Mueller published along with it called the Cosmographia Introductio, and that book um, contains a description of the map and mentions the map on the cover. Um, but this is the, the room at Wolfegg. Obviously, you can see it's no longer the rare book library there. Um, it is now the children's library at, at Wolfegg. And when I visited, there were lots of little children who wanted to show me all their books that, you know, I shouldn't really be looking at the old ones. They wanted to show me the new ones. So. So, but, uh, but it's an amazing, it's an amazing room and, and it is in, in the, the south tower, the southeast tower of the, of the, the library or the castle itself. Now, Schoner um, was an amazing character in the fact that he owned a fairly large library for this period. Um, I've estimated it that it probably was around 1,200 volumes, which is huge for, for this period of time. Um, not all of them were purchased. Um, as we get a, a little bit further into this, you'll see some of them were borrowed and simply never returned. Um, some of them were, were seemingly stolen, but um, um, he, he really did get stuff any way he possibly could. But one thing he did with all of his books is he heavily annotated them. And this is a, sa a sample of, of some of his annotations. Um, and this is typically what you face when you open a Schoner book. And this is from his 1482 Ulm Ptolemy. Um, the Ulm Ptolemy is a, an edition of Ptolemy's Geographia from 1482. It's one of the most important editions that were done. And, and Schoner annotated extremely heavily. And one of the things he was very interested in was projections. Um, for those of you who aren't map enthusiasts and don't know, um, if we think of the Earth as an orange um, and you try and peel um, the skin off of an orange and flatten it out. You're going to have to tear it or twist it or, or do something to it in order to get it flat. You can't, you can't make it perfectly flat without doing something to it. And if you think of a map the same way, the map is the surface of the earth that we're peeling off and trying to flatten. And we have to do something to it. We have to distort it. We have to tear it. We have to do something to it in order to flatten it out. And a map projection is simply a mathematical way in order to keep track of those distortions. So in fact, you can make an accurate map um, on a flat surface. And Schoner was really, really interested in, in, in projections. And one of the things that's unique about Schoner in really the history of cartography, and as far as I can tell in the history of science, was he was obsessed with what is called the inverse projection problem. He was obsessed with the problem of taking a flat map and converting it back into a globe. Um, especially early in his career. And there are very, very few people who were creating globes out of flat maps in the way he was doing it. And, and we'll see some of his annotations on the Waltzy Mueller maps um, reflect his attempt to solve an, in, an inverse projection problem. The thing we're looking at here is you'll see there's a sort of trapezoid figure in the middle there. Schoner was trying to determine what is an extremely complicated problem also, which is determining what Ptolemy did to these sort of maps. These are Ptolemy's trapezoidal projections. These are his regional and high scale maps that are found within the Geographia. You'll see that they're not square, that they are also trapezoids, that they are longer at the bottom than at the top. And there's a certain distortion that happens between the, the top and the bottom. And, and Schoner was really concerned about what the distortions are here. Now, one of the reasons that Schoner is 
obsessed with accurate mapping, and I'll mention this when I get into the astrology a little bit, is he's really obsessed with finding accurate locations of places. And those places he needs because he's practicing a particular type of astrology called natal astrology. And he needs a time of birth and he needs an exact location of the person's birth. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But when you're thinking of Schoner's use of his maps, you should think about the fact that more than a lot of the map makers of this period who are basically looking at large-scale cosmographies and looking at the world, and even Waltzemuller, who's, who's sort of presenting an overall universal vision of what the world looks like, Schoner is really, really obsessed with looking at accuracy and looking at what, what, what actual places are on the surface of the Earth and where they are. Now, his projection studies extend very, very deeply, and this is in the back of his 1482 Ptolemy. The, this particular book is actually at the National Library in Vienna, and he makes extensive, extensive notes on Ptolemy's second projection, and in, later in the volume, he makes extensive notes on Ptolemy's second projection, which is the one that Waltzemuller used. Now, Ptolemy's second projection that Waltzemuller used is a little bit strange. Waltzemuller modifies it a little bit. Um, and it appears as if that Schoner's notes reflect those modifications and that Schoner, in fact, had in front of him while he was doing this Waltzemuller's map. It, it may be the only connection that we know of between a scholar and the 1507 map itself, um, except for a few mentions of it that, that happened much later. But it's at a really important mathematical point that occurs um, deeply inside Schoner's notes. Um, these sort of things I spent years and years and years, unfortunately, of my life and, and eyesight, you know, reading these things, most of which were, were not all that interesting, but, but there were these extreme gems that, that would pop out. Now, besides cartography, Schoner was very, very interested in astronomy. And this is an extremely important text, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this later on. Um, this is all sort of intro material to kind of rev you up to the, to the actual Schoner's use of these materials. But this is, a, a, this is a, a manuscript that is a bit of a palimpsest, in fact. What we're looking at here is we're looking at a manuscript of Georg Purbach's New Theory of the Planets was probably the most important astronomical textbook um, up until Copernicus's time. And uh, almost everyone learned their, their, um, their astronomy from it, from about 1400 up until um, Schoner's time and a little bit later. Um, but this particular thing is interesting because it's in the hand, it's a copy of the book, in the hand of a very famous astronomer whose name is Regio Montanus. And we'll talk a little bit about Reggio Montanus a little bit later because Schoner's fate and Reggio Montanus's fate and somewhat of the fate of the Waltzemuller maps resides um, in the combination of those three people. Um, but this is in Reggio Montanus's hand and is also covered with Schoner's annotations. Um, it's an extremely important book. Um, it's also in the library in Vienna. One of the things that's important about it happens in the beginning of the book, however, um, not on these pages. In the beginning of this book, um, there's bound into it an ephemeris. And an ephemeris is basically um, a list of planetary positions for a particular time and a particular place. And it's, it has lists of stars, where they would be found, lists of planets, eclipses, that sort of thing, calculated for a place. Um, the one that Schoner has bound into the front of this is from Vienna. Um, and what's interesting about it is ephemeris in Greek is, is diary. Um, and Schoner has then annotated all around the outsides with a diary. He has basically written um, some of his early, um, early life into this diary. And that is the only place that we really get a sense of his personal life. Um, and basically what he writes is he talks about a relationship he has with a, a woman. He talks about the th three children she bore him. He talks a lot about the various places that he, he, was, uh, he was a parish priest at this period, so he had three children out of wedlock with a, um, a, a woman. And at the end of it, he is back in Bamberg, um, which is where he was ordained in the, in the bishopric of Bamberg. And um, basically at that point, um, he's considering the conversion to Lutheranism. 
Um, so uh, Schoner will, will convert, um, and, and he will become the first professor in Nuremberg um, of mathematics in 1526. So this is a long sort of trajectory to getting to, to Schoner the astronomer and Schoner the astrologer. Um, there's a lot of parish priest work. There's a lot of, of um, taking care of children. Uh, but uh, it's, it's interesting that this is the only place, it's, and he's done it in the border of, of this particular book. Now, the only, when I ask you to remember what the Samoban look like, it's because we're going to be looking at a lot of books like this that look exactly like the Samoban. Um, Schoner didn't just create one gathering. He created many, 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 many gatherings of, of materials. So the Samoban that, that, that you're used to seeing and that the library has in its collection is, is just one of many. Um, this is another one. Uh, this is Plimpton Manuscript 188. It is the only other book um, by Schoner that is not in the Vienna Library, um, the only major work of Schoner. There's a few pages here and there that have become scattered. But this is Plimpton Manuscript 188. It's a, a gathering um, that rivals, I at least think, of importance. Uh, most people don't, and cartographic historians certainly don't, but I think this manuscript rivals in importance the, the gathering um, that we have here, the, the Samobond. And really, this particular thing, um, the, the gathering that we have there, and, and we'll get into the contents in a minute, is really, um, it's a whole group of Regio Montanus manuscripts um, and a few manuscripts from a few other people. And just for those who don't know, Regio Montanus was an extremely important um, young mathematician and astronomer. He died in 1476, so he died well before Schoner is looking um, and doing any scholarly work whatsoever. Um, but Schoner is going to become intimately involved with Re Regio Montanus' stuff simply because when he comes to Nuremberg in 1526 and becomes professor of mathematics, just a few years before that, the Nuremberg City Council had purchased Regio Montanus' entire library. And Schoner is going to find in that library many of the most important manuscripts that, that, that we have that basically talk about the, the movement of Arabic and Greek mathematics and astronomy to the north that aren't coming through um, Rome and aren't coming through Florence, aren't coming through the Italian Renaissance, but they're coming through the German Renaissance directly through Vienna. And some of these manuscripts, and, and we'll talk about a couple of them in just a minute, are, are extremely critical to the history of science, much like the way the Waltzmuller maps are critical to the, to, the, to the history of cartography. Now, Regio Montanus died when he was 40 years old, and, and he's certainly the most brilliant late medieval mathematician that we know of. Um, and he published this particular little list here. And this list is a list of the books that Regio Montanus wanted to publish in his lifetime. So he made this list up while he was a student in Vienna, and he published it. He actually said, this is the list of books that I am going to publish. And there's about 70 or 80 different volumes on here, and, and it constitutes the most important works in the history of astronomy, mathematics, astrology, and geography up until this period. Um, Regio Montanus will die before he gets to publish any of them. Um, but Schoner will take some of the manuscripts, in fact, that Regio Montanus wants to publish, and Schoner will publish them. Um, and that's another part of Schoner's activity. He will edit and publish many, many very important books in mathematics, some, some of which were critical to astronomers like Copernicus later on. Um, and we'll get to that in, in just a second. Now, the Plimpton this is Nuremberg, by the way. Um, this is where Regio Montanus lived, and this is also where um, Schoner is, is going to become, or becomes in 1526, the professor of, of mathematics, the first professor of mathematics. This is from the, the Nuremberg Chronicles. So. Now, the manuscript itself, this is what the Plimpton 188 looks like, and, and there are a number of titles in here. Um, the one I'm showing um, is one of the things that I've spent a lot of time on, and it's a really, really critical manuscript. It's um, by a man whose name is Johann de Meurs, and Johann de Meurs was a mathematician, um, an extremely important mathematician, who wrote a book called the Quadripartum Numerorum. And the Quadripartum Numerorum is one of the first instances we have um, of algebra being transferred from the Greeks to, 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 to the north. Um, Regio Montanus, whose hand this is in, um, had found several really important manuscripts in Vienna, one by a, a person whose name is Diophantus, who was an extremely important Greek mathematician, um, and several others. Um, 
and this particular uh, manuscript is is really important because um, Schoner will actually take this manuscript and he will he will publish it at some point. And this is really what the manuscript looks like. <clears throat> and what we have is a series of problems. And basically these are, it's not a text that teaches you how to do algebra, it's a text that automatically assumes that you know um, algebra. It's a text that um, assumes that you have a, a familiarity with it, which is kind of a strange thing um, at this period simply because there are so few people who would know anything about this. Um, the Diophantine manuscripts that were circulating at the time people couldn't make heads or tails of for the most part. Um, but basically, the manuscript has the, the hand of Reggio Montanus who copied it. Um, it has annotations by both Schoner, Reggio Montanus, and several other um, really important um, people, and, and, and I've been able to trace six or seven different hands in, in this particular manuscript. Um, and that's basically what it looks like. Now, Schoner is going to publish it as something called the Algorithmus. And the Algorithmus is really interesting because the difference between the manuscript version and the, the, the actual printed version is really critical to, to getting an idea of who Schoner was and how he understood this material. Um, one of the things that's fascinating is in the manuscript itself, Reggio Montanus uses actual symbolic algebraic, no algebraic notation. In other words, notation like you would think of your algebra high school class um, with x squareds and that sort of stuff. It's one of the first instances where we see symbolic algebra being used um, that, that's coming through the Greeks. The Greeks did it a little bit of it, but but Reggio Montanus uses it quite extensively in the manuscript. Schoner eliminates it. And it's interesting because he eliminates it in places where it appears as if he might not have understood um, exactly what he was reading. Um, so again, it's one of those things where we see Schoner as this collector and publisher, but not necessarily as the most brilliant scientist or most brilliant mathematician working out there. And, and I think this is a theme that, that comes back again and again when we're, we're talking about, about Schoner's life. Now, the other thing I talked about in the beginning was Schoner's astrological work. And like I said, I think this is um, perhaps the most important aspect of, of Schoner's, Schoner's work. Um, Schoner wrote several books on astrology, um, introductions to astrology, and some very, very technical manuals on how a particular form of astrology was done, um, which is called natal astrology. And this is um, an image from one of the books, a schematic of one of the images from Schoner's book. And this is a typical medieval and early Renaissance astrological chart. Um, I'll show you one of the ones that Schoner actually drew up in, in just a minute in, in manuscript form. But basically, Natal astrology is a particular form of astrology that was very, very popular during this period, which doesn't predict events necessarily. Uh, most of the practitioners are not interested in, pr in predicting events, like an earthquake is going to happen or there's going to be a flood or something like that. Um, most of the people who practice this are interested in determining the future personalities and the future life prospects of their children. And this is also, by the way, the type of astrology that, in, in fact, um, Galileo will practice. Um, Galileo, in his extant notes, um, um, has um, actual natal charts drawn up for his children um, and extensive commentaries on their personalities. And through his life, he, he updates those things and talks about how they're changing and how, you know, it's because this particular thing in Jupiter is, is changing. Um, one of the asides... Um, that happened in Galileo's time where natal astrologers had developed this great, great system of where planets and where things moved. Um, with the discovery by Galileo of Jupiter's moons, it kind of threw everything into a, oh my God, there's more things to keep track of sort of idea. Um, but, but Schoner practiced natal astrology. He was an expert in natal astrology. If you try and read this, it is just mind-bending in its complications. Um, one of the things that you see... Um, and when I, in the beginning, talked about this separation, um, mixed sciences and pure sciences, one of the things you'll see is a, a vast separation here, even though they're riding on each other, between astronomy and astrology. Um, astrology is, of course, you know, the same people who are doing astronomy are doing astrology. Um, astrology is not considered causally or epistemologically any different than astronomy. But um, one of the things you'll see is there's very little 
astrology placed into astronomical texts, whereas there's lots of astronomy placed into astrological texts. And there's a couple reasons for that. And Schoner really goes into real detail attempting to defend uh, natal astrology against uh, people who are, are writing against it at this period. There's a real, a real conflict of, of theologies and, and sort of causal theories um, of astronomy and astrology coming to a head at this point. Um, not only because of Copernicus, but there's also the Reformation and, and the attempts to sort of solidify um, sort of theological works. Um, one of the things that we see in Schoner um, is a real, a real sort of trajectory towards a more deductive sense of what science is. Um, I wouldn't call him a, a, a scientist in any, any real sense, but, but there's an underlying, underlying logic and there's an underlying um, 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 train of thought which he's deriving um, from people like Grotesta and some of these early logicians. Um, there's a very important person to, to Schoner whose name is Augustino Nifo, who's a logician writing at this period, um, and, and Schoner is going to take his ideas of, of what causality in science is. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't preclude astrological and natal prediction. That's just included under the umbrella. We can't really separate the two at this time. Now, this is a typical natal chart. This is one of Schoner's. Um, this is actually um, was found in one of his uh, his copy of of um, of the introduction to astrology. Um, it's a practice text. Um, don't know whether this is an early t thing that he did just because he was practicing. Um, it doesn't identify um, exactly who it is that he is um, that he is uh, doing a, a reading for. But basically, what you see is you see the various houses of the of the zodiac on this thing. That's what the all of those those twelve triangles around there are, and where the planets are, and what their positions are. Um, and where they're moving and, and where they're going. And, and basically, most of natal astrology derives, like a lot of the stuff that we see in this period in geography, from Ptolemy's text. Uh, Ptolemy wrote an important text called the Tetrabiblos, um, and almost all of the astrology that, that Schoner is practicing um, is not an updated form. It's not a form that seems to rely very much on the medieval commentators on the Tetra Biblos. It seems to be a, a very pure form that, that he's taking very much from, from Ptolemy's text. Now, there's a preface that's written to, to Schoner's book, and, and this really begins to kind of get to the point um, of Schoner as a person who's preserving texts. Um, even the people who are writing about Schoner and... <clears throat> Philip uh, Melanthon, Melanthon is a really important um, um, person of the period. He founds a school. He does a lot of educational reforms in Germany of this period. Um, he's also instrumental in getting mathematics added to the university curriculum. Um, so he is not exactly um, an irrational human being or, or anything that would give you a sense that 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 he is um, dogmatic in any way as far as religion religion goes. He is of course Protestant. Um, he is part of the the Reformation um, redoing of some of the educational systems in the in northern Germany. And he's also a pro astrology. Um, he writes about Schoner. He writes the preface to actual Schoner's book, um, and uh, basically talks about Schoner as being the person who preserved this science, who's basically done all the work to kind of bring this science and, and to, to, keep it, to keep it stable, and otherwise it would be lost. And, and we're going to see that um, again and again and again as we move through some of Schoner's other stuff, and, 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 and really that's what sort of prefigures what's happening with the Samobond and, and Schoner's compiling of all these texts in order to save them for, for, for later later generations. Um, the, in, the, in the actual preface to the, to the text, um, there's actually a natal chart for Schoner himself. Um, so this is basically the prediction of Schoner's brilliance and his, his work in mathematics and, and his devotion to, 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 to God. And uh, so it's a, um, uh, basically a, what a typical natal chart looks like of the period. Now, Schoner annotates his maps, and uh, this is a contention which is sort of um, not accepted by everyone. I think um, Chet Van Duzer, my co-author on the naming of America, and I argue over this constantly, um, uh, Schoner's annotations on the maps that we know that he owned. 
Um, the 1507 map and the 1516 Carta Marina are both annotated with red grids. Um, some of the most important um, places are tipped in red um, and coordinates are pulled off the maps. Now there are long, long lists of coordinates that are in Schoner's notes. Um, and there are really two reasons that Schoner could have been taking the coordinates of places. Um, one, of course, would be um, the fact that he is building globes early on in his career, 1515, 1520, he is doing a lot of work with globes. Um, he did some of the most radical and, and most important early globes that we know of. Um, the 1515 globe in particular um, also shows, like Waltzie Mueller, a path around South America and a Pacific Ocean. Um, Schoner also places the name America on the globe itself, and well, I'll show you that in just a moment when, when we get to what's inside the Samelbund itself. But he annotates the maps with these really, really um, precise grids. Um, there are some areas of the map where um, the grids are a little bit more detailed than others, and one can trace in his notes um, some of the regions that he was taking coordinates off of. Um, I will tell you in his notes he favors the 1516 map heavily, um, which is a much better map as far as its overall, and, and I hate to use the word cartographic accuracy, than, than the 1507 map, but, but, but it is a little bit more accurate. Um, but I believe Schoner was doing this a little bit later. Um, the Samuel Bond, as far as I can tell, was probably bound together at about 1530, 1532, and I'll go into my reasons for that in a little while. Um, so it was bound well after he finished with globe making. Schoner tended to finish with his globes early in his career and then sort of directed himself toward the more astrological and astronomical and mathematical pursuits later on. Um, especially in the 1530s and the early 1540s, he is very much involved in, in the more astrological um, stuff than he is in, in the geographical material. Now, the other way that we know stuff about Schoner's life, besides the, the diary and the ephemeris that I talked about earlier, is the fact that Schoner um, wrote prefaces to all of the books that he published. And, and he wrote prefaces that are quite quite interesting. Um, they show kind of his attitude towards the world, toward his attitude towards what he's doing. Um, this particular book, um, which is called On Triangles of Every Sort, is based on a Reggio Montanus manuscript. And, and it's ba a re the Reggio Montanus manuscript that it's based on somehow, and no one really knows how this occurred, made its way to St. Petersburg. It's in the library in St. Petersburg. Um, but in the preface to this, um, Schoner's going to make some really interesting comments about his time and what he's actually doing by publishing and, and preserving. And I'm just going to read a short excerpt from the preface, a little bit longer than the one that's on the screen, um, just so we get a sense of, of what these prefaces are like. And Schoner begins this one. He says, During these turbulent times, when we are hemmed in by the stupidity of men, we see these arts nearly abandoned by all mortals. For this reason, no one understands the praise I may evoke through the famous works I publish. For what is more worthy of the praise of letters than their protection? And in what battle do the arts seem more freely to spend their strength than in the praise of culture and its defense? When I took this task of publishing and editing the works of Reggio Montanus upon myself, I considered not so much what I wanted to do, but simply what was possible in these times. I had some fear that my abilities in these scientific arts would not be up to the task, that it would cause, give cause for complaints from my readers and from you. Now I know that complaints will only come from those who know little of the sciences. You know the times. No one really looks for a rebirth of the arts. They are so silent and neglected, it may well be feared that the dolts around us will stamp them out. <laughs> and so Schoner really is, is, is making sort of a commentary on the people around him, um, on the, the arts and sciences, and really on the fact that, that, that no one really understands why he's publishing and saving these materials. Now, one of the things that gives us really explicit evidence that he kind of knew what he was doing as the proto-conservator or proto-archivist that, that I'm kind of um, making him out to be is the book plates that he put in many of these compilations. Um, this is the book plate that actually comes from the Schoner Samelbond. Uh, it appears in Schoner's copy of the 1482 Ptolemy. It also appears in, in, in several of his hard um, oak-bound notebooks. And the translation of this is, I think, the most telling thing. It, it says that Schoner gives this to you, posterity. 
as long as it exists, there is a monument to his spirit. And so he, he really is, is giving it to posterity. He really is saying that this is for the future um, and, and that, you know, as long as it survives, there's a monument to me who, who saved it. Um, he, he, is, he is definitely not, not, um, not egoless. So. So. And the other thing that Schoner is involved in, and, and as he um, approached the, near the end of his life in the fift, late 1530s and 1540s, um, after he sort of went through the publishing of those materials, the, the book that I just talked about, The On Triangles of Every Sort, was published in 1533. Um, his publishing is going to slow down a little bit. Uh, he'll publish a couple astrological books. And then at the end of his life, um, in the 15, late 1530s, 1538, he begins to take on students, and we begin to, begin to know some of these students' names. Um, and the most important student that he took on is a man named um, Joachim Redicus. And Redicus um, was instrumental. He was a mathematician who was um, educated in Vienna and several other places. And he came to Schoner um, in 1538, 1539 um, to study with him. And he, as he was with Schoner for about a year or so, he decided to go off to Krakow and to go off to Krakow and to meet and learn what Copernicus was doing. Um, and in the book, I talk a little bit about this. Um, but the question of how is it that Schoner or anyone in Nuremberg kind of knew what Copernicus was up to. Copernicus kept things fairly quiet, um, didn't really want to publish the heliocentric system, um, and had to be convinced to do so. But in around 1510, 1512, uh, Copernicus will produce a manuscript called the Commentariolus. That's how it's come down to us known. There's only a few copies that exist. Um, the Commentary Olus is basically a primitive version of what Copernicus will publish in the De Revolutionibus, and basically a primitive version of the theory that, in fact, that the Earth moves and it goes around the Sun, um, and that the Sun is, in fact, stationary as opposed to the other way around. Um, this does not seem to have circulated widely, but it's my contention that a copy of it was known well by Schoner. Um, there are several indications of this in some of his notes to the Purebach, which he seems to have come back time and time again to. So when Redicus <laughs> arrived, um, and Schoner was at this point interested in astronomy and astrology, it was only natural, I think, that he sent this brilliant student off to Copernicus to, to see what Copernicus was up to. Um, after being uh, with Copernicus for a short time, um, Redicus will write a letter back. Um, to Schoner. It uh, was published um, before it was actually received by Schoner, uh, dedicated to Schoner, called the Narratio Prima. And the Narratio Prima is really the first published statement we have of the Copernican theory. Um, Redicus, um, two years before Copernicus publishes in, 1440, in 1543, will really outline in detail um, Copernicus' his heliocentric system, and he will also provide much of the polemic um, that will be printed in later years defending it. Um, several of the early editions of the, of the, the, of the De Revolution ebus will actually print um, the Narratio Prima in it, um, along with it. Um, but it's an extremely important text that, that Schoner had first kind of dibs on. Um, but there seems to have been a, a great deal of discussion in Nuremberg at this time um, about Copernicus's theories. Um, one of the things that's interesting in the, de in the de revolution ebus itself, um, uh, actual Copernicus will actually give Schoner credit for several of the most important astronomical observations of the planet Mercury, Mercury being a very difficult uh, mathematical exercise for Copernicus. Um, so Schoner is, is seem seemingly intimately involved in, in some of these activities also. Now, back to the Samobond, um, just so we can kind of wrap up on, on, on the things that we actually have here. Um, the Samobond itself, you, you've seen the binding. It, of course, contains the 1507 and 1516 world maps by Martin Waltzemuller, which, I, as I said in the beginning, I'm not really going to talk much about. But it contains some other extremely important objects. Um, everything that is bound into the Samobond is the only surviving copy. So one can make an argument that it is the single most important collection of Renaissance cartographic and astronomical materials to have survived. Um, the thing that we're looking at now is a set of globe gores. They're celestial gores. They are done by Johann Schoner. This is uh, an early version of Schoner's globe gores. Um, Schoner produced in 1517 um, a globe, a celestial globe. 
This one differs from it in a number of very, very important ways. I'm not going to go into the details, but, but it differs in a lot of important ways. It's also heavily annotated by Schoner. Um, Schoner is looking at the comparisons between the positions um, of various star charts that he, he uses in order to, to, to actually incorporate these. Um, one of the interesting things in, about Schoner's globes is we don't have very much record of, of how many he made and, and how widespread they were. Um, there is an interesting painting in the National Gallery of Art in, in London um, called The Ambassadors by, by Holbein. Um, you've probably all seen it. It's two ambassadors standing in their fairy coats with astronomical instruments all around them. There's a celestial globe sitting on the one side. It is Schoner's celestial globe because there's some important differences that are on that globe. Um, so they at least had to travel a little bit. Um, but this is the only surviving copy of this particular globe's um, um, uh, gores. The other thing that, we, that was in there is in the binding, um, when Joseph Fisher, as I talked about earlier, the discoverer of the volume, um, um, took it apart um, in order to make a lithograph. There was a lithograph facsimile made of the 1507 and 1516 world maps um, in 1903, two years after its discovery. Um, when he took it apart, he found these in the binding. Um, these are, in fact, um, also fragments um, of a globe. Um, this, again, is a different Schoner celestial globe than the one that I showed you before. So, again, this is another globe that we have no representative copies. All we have are these fragments. The other strange thing about this particular globe gore is that it's printed on vellum, so it's printed on, on animal skin. Um, it's the only known globe gore that's printed on animal skin. Uh, why one would print a globe gore on animal skin, I don't know. Um, but it was obviously some sort of, believe, I, at least I believe, failed experiment. Um, um, but uh, maybe he thought it would be more durable. Uh, we don't have any leather globed, uh, leather uh, gores that I, that I know of. So um, the other thing that was found in the binding was fragments of a terrestrial globe. Um, this is, again... Um, a f example of Schoner's terrestrial globe, and there's a couple things that are very important to see here. On the left, I've got the relevant Waltzemuller sheet. Um, you'll see that Schoner has also written the name America, um, and this particular gore probably dates from 1515, so it's a very early representation. You'll also see that South America um, has a passage around it with a continent, in fact, shown below it. Um, so South America is even much more radically portrayed at this time um, by Schoner than it is by Waltzemuller on the 1507 map. Um, it's an extremely important gore. Again, there are differences. Um, Schoner did a 1515 globe. He also did a 1523 globe. There are important differences between this gore and both of those. So again, the only surviving known copy. Um, just so you can see uh, one particular aspect that, of course, leads us to believe that this was a lot of this was taken from Waltzemuller's text is the fact that on the Waltzemuller um, map on the right hand side here, Waltzemuller has included this characteristic break, which has called, now been called by scholars the Waltzemuller gap. Um, this is a gap that you can almost bet anyone who puts it um, on a map has derived it from seeing the 1507 map because there are almost no other maps that show it. Um, Schoner is actually taking the, the, the gap and, and also putting it in place on, on, his, on his globe. Um, this is just another view. Um, the view on the right is from the 1515 globe that shows the passage um, just the way the, the, the fragments do. So the 1515 globe is actually still survives in Frankfurt, um, and uh, it will be the 500th anniversary of it coming up. Um, next year, and there's going to, or two years from now, and there'll be a big, big celebration in Frankfurt of the Globe and in Nuremberg. And the last thing that was bound into the Samuel Bond is the only part of the Samuel Bond that isn't still with it. Um, it is this star chart. Um, this is a star chart of the Southern Hemisphere by Albrecht Dürer. Um, Schoner has heavily annotated it. This is the first known printed star chart, by the way. Um, this is of the Southern Hemisphere. And Schoner annotates it heavily. Um, this particular star chart is known to be very inaccurate, especially in the southern hemisphere. If one thinks about it, we are in, um, in, in this case, we are in 1515 to 1518 uh, when these, this star chart is being composed and, and printed. Um, the southern hemisphere, stars in the summer hemisphere, they can't see below, be seen below the equator. There's not a lot of, of information on, on those. 
um, but it's considered quite inaccurate, and, and, and Schoner has annotated it quite heavily. Um, he's also annotated it with lots and lots of different stellar names. Um, a lot of these are extremely important because he's basically transliterating some of the Arabic names um, for very important stars like Spica, um, stars that, that really figure critically into actually Copernicus's observations and Copernicus's um, examples that he uses in the De-Revolution ebus. Um, this hasn't been studied very well, these annotations. Um, they've been looked at by a number of scholars, um, and the changes also um, that he makes to the chart. Um, there is some sense that, that, that Schoner is working through some very complex astro astrological, astronomical problem. Um, I haven't been able to kind of make heads or tails of it. A lot of the star names that Schoner has written here and that he's talking about um, are from the northern hemisphere and don't actually even appear on the, the thing itself. The star chart is one of the key pieces to the Samelbon, uh, it, its history, um, simply because it is thought by the Prince of Wolfegg that his family, in fact, and, and we talked early about how that particular volume might have gotten separated from the rest of the library. Um, the Prince of Wolfegg has the largest collection of Dürer prints in private hands and believes that sometimes during the Thirty Years' War that his family acquired the Samelbond um, just for the star chart itself, the fact that the star chart was there. Um, they cannot, you know, obviously there's no, they have no evidence to that, there's no list of the library during that period, um, but it's an interesting speculation. So that's really what I have for you. I've just kind of given an overview of kind of the areas the book covers. Um, the, the whole point of the, of, of, of the book, at least from my perspective, this is the third in the series of my Waltzie Mueller books, and I will say the final um, <laughs> Um, in a series. Um, there are many, many scholars who will come after me that I hope will do a much, much better job. Um, my co-author, for instance, on the naming of America, Chet Van Duzer, has the sort of obsession, youth, and drive that will, 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 will move this, this stuff forward. So thank you all for coming and listening. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.